Good evening. Welcome to the uh, divine evening service at Christ United Reformed Church. Uh, our call to worship this evening comes from Psalm 47. Uh, sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with the psalm. God reigns over the nations, God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Let us stand together to hear God's greeting. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth, and he greets us this evening from the letter to the Galatians. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we receive God's greeting, let's express praise to our triune God by singing the Gloria Patria. Evening, let's turn to our Trinity Psalter hymnals to sing Psalm 47a. O clap your hands, Psalm 47a. O clap your hands. now take your seats. Our confession of faith reading comes from the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 11, question 29 and 30, um, and it's found at the back of the hymnal on page 876 to 877. 876 to 877. It's within the, the grace section of our catechism that highlights our exclusive hope in Jesus and why he's the only one who could rescue us from our greatest problem. And so we ask in question 29, why is the Son of God called Jesus, meaning Savior? Because he saves us from our sins and because salvation is not to be sought 
or found in anyone else. Do those who look for their salvation and security in saints, in themselves or elsewhere, really believe in the only Savior, Jesus? No, although they boast of being his, by their actions, they deny the only Savior, Jesus. Having not a perfect Savior, or those who in true faith accept this Savior, have in him all they need for their salvation. Let us now turn to God in a time of evening prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we confess that we have no other hope, we have no other comfort except in you, O Lord, through the grace and peace that we have in union with Christ and the spirit that lives within us. And we recognize that because of that hope, whenever our souls are greatly troubled, whenever we feel the distress of life, especially in this present evil age, we know that you are the Lord who truly cares for us, who watches over us whenever we call upon you so that you hear our plea. And we know that you accept our prayers not because of anything worthy in us, but because we have a mediator who can sympathize with our weaknesses and who can enable with confidence, enable us with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace to receive mercy in time of need. Father, we thank you for your great providence in creation, for how manifold are your works. In wisdom, you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. You set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. And so grant us the right heart and attitude to have a holy reverence in all of you. Rekindle our faith, deepen our trust to always depend upon you whenever we feel in doubt, whenever we feel we lack the things we need for body and soul. Help us to be patient in adversity and thankful in prosperity. Help us to realize that when we're tempted to look within ourselves, and are weighed down by the guilt, fear, and shame that you may lead us to look to Christ, knowing that his grace and forgiveness is applied to us daily. And Lord, help us to have confidence in our King, who sits on the throne, who rules with the mighty scepter, and sits at your right hand to slaughter the wicked on the day of his wrath. And God, we want to thank you for the many earthly fathers you have given us, especially those who belong to you, we appreciate them and are eternally grateful for how you use fathers to care and lead and provide for the family. Continue to strengthen, grant wisdom, protection, and grace to fathers, especially when being a father requires many sacrifices. But for many who remember their fathers today yet find it painful because they are no longer with us or have never experienced the father's care, May you comfort them and may you remind all of us that you are our perfect father, a heavenly father through your precious son who remains faithful in all that you do for us in which no earthly father can compare. And now, Lord, knowing that there are many things that weigh in our hearts, many concerns and desires, we lift them up to you this evening, knowing that in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, you will hear us and grant us your peace, which surpasses all understanding. And so we pray all this through our elder brother, your son and our savior, in Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, we now turn to our time of offering for uh, Reverend Mihai Korsha. Um, and I think maybe as you were coming in here, there is the, the box um, that you're able to give your offering. And so as we think about Reverend Korsha and the mission work in Romania, let's give with a cheerful heart. Um, and so now let us stand once again as we sing our song of preparation, and it's found in our hymnals on page 172. Speak, O Lord, page 172.
as we open God's word, let's stand. Let's continue to stand and pray to ask him. Teach us, O Lord, the way of your statutes. Give us understanding that we may keep your law and observe it with our whole heart. Lead us in the path of your commandments, for we delight in it. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may now take your seats. Please open your Bibles to Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. And the title of our message this evening is Jesus Alone Rescues. Jesus Alone Rescues. Let's give attention to the reading of God's word. Hear now the word of God. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling but he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear. And said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Thus far the reading of God's word. May he bless it to us. The drama of this episode is a heart-wrenching, terrifying scene of when Jesus and his disciples were in the midst of a violent windstorm in the Sea of Galilee. And it happened just 60 miles north of Jerusalem in the ancient region of Palestine in the first century. And as we're entering the, the story of Jesus' ministry in Mark's gospel, we see at the beginning of Jesus' ministry that the kingdom of Christ has broken in. It, it has broken into our dark, sin cursed world, and Jesus inaugurates his kingdom with his words and deeds through chapters 1 to 8 performing miraculous signs and, and teaching what the kingdom looks like and what the citizens of his kingdoms look like and how he comes with such authority and power with a central purpose and mission. Jesus proclaims in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And so you see, but in reality, how do you think people respond with this proclamation? How did they respond? Did they respond with full acceptance? Did they receive Jesus with open arms? Well, throughout the Mark's gospel, there are some who believe, but there are folks that struggle to believe. Others plainly uh, rejected him, and many perhaps dismayed by how Jesus brings in the kingdom. But you know, these reactions aren't just problems in the past. They're real problems people face today, isn't it? Perhaps you're here today still unsure about who Jesus is and why he came, right? You're asking, how relevant can his words and deeds mean for my life? Or how can Jesus, who claims to be the Messiah, convince me to place my entire trust in him? Or even as we'll see in our passage, the disciples ask after Jesus calms the storm, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Well, I hope that as we study closely the drama of the windstorm in Mark chapter 4, that we can d discover together what really matters most in your life, right? What really is the priority of your soul right now? And, and how can we allow God's story to answer our deepest longings and questions that we all face about life and death? And so to summarize in one sentence just the core meaning of our passage this morning, it's this, that since Jesus is all-powerful all powerful to save sinners, 
you can have absolute trust in him. Let, let me repeat that. And since Jesus is all powerful to save sinners, you can have absolute trust in him. And how can we understand that important truth? Well, there are three things you can learn from the windstorm at sea if you're taking notes. Uh, first, you must realize your doubtful fears. And, and second, you must realize your powerful God. And finally, you must realize your faithful Savior, your doubtful fears, your powerful God, and finally, your faithful Savior. And we see that truth unfold in our passage where we read that after a long day of Jesus teaching and doing ministry to very large crowds, it grew dark outside. And, and he taught the whole day since daylight, and it's now evening, it, it's late, and you can barely see anything. And so Jesus decides, hey, you know, it's time to leave. It's time to pack up, time to go on the other side uh, because the whole day, you know, he's, he's been teaching. And, and we see in Mark chapter 4, verses 1 to 34, he's been teaching the parables to a large crowd beside the Sea of Galilee. And, and it's these parables that communicate how the kingdom is like and how the kingdom is received. Like when Jesus taught the parable of the sower, right? He, he teaches that if the seed ends up sown on the good soil, Jesus says it represents those who hear the word and accept the word and, and they bear fruit. But on the other hand, the seed that fell between the rocks and thorns are like those who don't receive the word. And so as a result, they could not bear fruit. And so you see, beloved, that's what the kingdom is. God's kingdom requires that a person has to have true faith to receive his word and bear fruit in their lives. And that's what Jesus teaches in the parable. And now in the event that the disciples were caught in a sea storm, we see a test of faith, whether the disciples have true faith, if they truly receive Christ. And so Jesus and his disciples wrap up that evening, and since they're already on a boat, Jesus says to his disciples, let's go across on the other side. And everything seems to be ordinary, right? As usual, they set sail until we read that the unexpected happens in verse 37. It says there, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling and that's what happened. They suddenly find themselves in a great violent windstorm out in sea. And the waves were so chaotic that it was filling their boat. And now archaeologists have uh, excavated a first century, uh, really a fishing boat, which was most likely the boat they used. And, and the boat is about, about 27 feet long. And we're not talking about a small rowboat, but neither is it is a massively huge boat. And so you can imagine being on a 27-foot fishing boat in the middle of a violent windstorm, right? Surrounded by crashing waves that are hitting your boat. And, and geographically, if you're at the Sea of Galilee, you'll notice steep hills on all sides of the lake, in which one scholar comments that it makes it susceptible to sudden storms, cooler air from the hills, they can rush down and, and they can collide with warm air in the lake's basin, creating these uh, sudden gusts of wind. And you know, most of these disciples, they were professional fishermen. I mean, they knew these waters very well and, and how to troubleshoot storms. But that evening, their skills and experience were no match against this force of nature. And so it seems that they had every reason to fear for their lives. One theologian comments saying that even a good swimmer will eventually drown if he cannot reach land. And stormy water is more threatening for both swimmers and non-swimmers. Sinking into the water is like sinking into the grave, into the underworld. The psalmist also describes the sea as a graveyard saying, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. 
And so you see it's interesting that the water in Scripture not only symbolizes life, but it also symbolizes death. And in the midst of this chaos, what is Jesus doing? Well, we read in verse 38, Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And you ask, well, why was he asleep, right? First of all, Jesus, as the God-man, was exhausted, right? He was doing work all day, and, and you'd feel exhausted, and you need rest. But obviously, he was very exhausted, that not even a sea storm could, could wake him up. And, and I remember, uh, uh, and I was sharing with Marissa, my wife, uh, this morning. One time, I remember our five-year-old daughter, Sophia, she, she had skipped her, her nap time, and she was busy all day. And then when she, slept, when she slept that night, she actually had rolled out of bed, and she hit the floor. And, and we thought that she was going to wake up, but we looked over, and guess what? She was still knocked out. <laughs> she was dead tired. And, and so when the disciples, they saw that Jesus wasn't reacting, he was asleep. They thought he didn't care about them. And so they woke him up, teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? Don't you care that we're about to die, that any moment now the boat will sink and we'll all go down and it's all over? Notice their accusatory tone. I mean, they, they knew enough that Jesus was qualified to address this emergency, right? They've been with him. They've seen healings, how he casted out demons, he, how he spoke with authority. But now the disciples are in grave danger against the forces of nature. Could Jesus really do something? And does he even care? And it's at this moment that the disciples' hearts were exposed. They weren't only terrified by what was going on, but they had real doubts. Is Jesus who he says he is? And why? What would cause them to doubt? Well, they still haven't fully realized during this stage of Jesus' ministry who they're dealing with, right? It, it hasn't fully sink in yet that the man who stands before them is the God-man, the Lord of the universe, that the Lord of the universe is with them in the boat. And yet they couldn't fully comprehend why he wouldn't just do something. And so as we see this, their doubtful fears reveal a fundamental human problem, isn't it? Right? The fundamental human problem, and what is that? What's the problem? Well, it, it's the problem of the heart. It's, it's the heart that refuses to wholeheartedly trust in Jesus. And it's the same heart problem that you and I share. It's the same heart problem in the garden. When Adam and Eve doubted and believed the lie, when the serpent asked, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Because by eating the forbidden fruit, it will make you what? make you wise. It will make you like God, the serpent says. And how did they respond? Well, they doubted. They believed the lie. They did not trust in God. And because they broke God's law, Adam was cursed. He, and that Adam was cursed and plunged the rest of humanity under this curse. And so as fallen creatures, the truth is our hearts are inclined to doubt God because as the prophet Jeremiah says in 17.9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. The heart is sinful. And since the heart is sinful, we are inclined to look within ourselves to find ultimate hope. We look to the world for happiness. We keep on searching and searching. We shop around for this material thing there or this idea here and, or chasing this dream over there. But it never truly satisfies. It never brings peace. Not to say that it's bad, but none of these things are ultimate. And so I like what St. Augustine says, the heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. And that's why, beloved, we need a heart transplant. We need a heart transplant. 
And God promises his people in Ezekiel chapter 36, I will take your heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. God needs to renew your heart. He needs to renew your mind. He needs to renew your will so that you can now learn to trust in him. And so like the disciples, we need not only to trust in Jesus to deliver us from death in a sea storm or whatever circumstance we may find ourselves in, but we need to be delivered from the death of our souls. And the only way is by true faith, which looks outside yourself to whom? Not within yourself, but believing what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians, that it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone that saves you. Amen. And if your heart learns to trust in Christ alone, then it's evident that you have a new heart, that your sins are forgiven, and that you have a renewed hope, a new confidence in which all your guilty sins and doubts and fears can no longer rule you because guess what? Jesus has conquered them all. He can give you a new life, a new freedom, so that being united with him by his spirit, you can truly live. And so the question that we, we asked with the disciples, Jesus, do you care that we are dying? And the answer is yes, Jesus does care. But not only does he care for your physical life, but more importantly, he cares to save you from the wrath of God that you and I deserve and to give you spiritual life, and that's life in his son. And so, beloved, this evening, ask yourself, where have you been placing your ultimate trust. Who is Lord over your life right now? Because if you haven't found Christ, if you haven't been trusting in Christ, today is the day of salvation. It's right now. For the Lord extends his mercy and forgiveness until he comes again to judge the living and the dead. And so this leads us to our second truth as this drama unfolds. And the second truth is this that you must realize you're a powerful God. And that's Jesus, isn't it, right? The God-man. If you look at verse 39, we see that Jesus woke up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still, or, or quiet, be silent. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Notice the power of Jesus, right? He speaks a word, and it is done. What he commands, he completes. Because not only does the word have power, but notice from whom the word came from, right? It it came from the one who is divinely powerful. And there's no other creature who can compare with him. Jesus incarnate is in every way human like like us, except without sin, because he is God. He is the God-man. He is in one essence with the Father and Holy Spirit, who has all the fullness of deity within him, Colossians 2.9. And not only is he powerful, but I like, as our Belgic Confession says in Article 1, summarizes God, the nature of God, God is eternal, incomprehensible, invisible, unchangeable, infinite, almighty, completely wise, just, good, and the overflowing source of all good. This is who God is. This is who Jesus is in divine essence. He is the creator and we are the creatures. And and if you think Jesus randomly appeared in history, then you are mistaken. Because Jesus existed before the foundation of the world together with the Father and Holy Spirit. Because at creation, Jesus was there. In the garden, Jesus was there. In the burning bush, Jesus was there. In the parting of the Red Sea, Jesus was there. When the Israelites were led in the wilderness by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, guess who was there? Jesus. Jesus was there because Jesus led the way. And that's why we know Jesus was active throughout redemptive history. And and he remains active today by sustaining everything that exists. And, and the fact that you woke up this morning and, and you drove to church this morning and you, you drove back this evening and that you're able to breathe right now without even think, think, thinking is really dependent upon Jesus, right? 
Hebrews chapter 1 tells us, He is the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He, Jesus, check this out, upholds the universe by the word of His power. You hear that? He upholds the universe by the word of His power. And, and, and that's why when we read the glorious creation passages, like when God said, let there be light, and out of nothing there was light, we know that Jesus spoke creation into existence and has always sustained it by his word. And yet in the fullness of time, Jesus came into our dark, sin-cursed world, humbling himself as the word where we read in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then it says in verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so you see, he came with a purpose. And that purpose was to fulfill all prophecy that Jesus would come, Emmanuel, God with us, to be near us in human flesh, to speak words of life and to be the light in the darkness that would save us from the judgment of God. But not only that, his proclamation comes with demonstration. That the miraculous signs by his word, whether he heals a blind man to see, a paralytic to walk, the demons cast it out, the sea storm rebuke, what these signs communicate is that it authenticates that he is the son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name, John chapter 20. And why? Because he is almighty, powerful God. He can do the impossible. And perhaps one of the most powerful demonstrations of his word is when we hear him say, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Your record is wiped clean. Because I alone have authority on earth to truly forgive sins. And that's powerful. And, and that's amazing grace. And his, free, and his forgiveness it isn't a slow process, right? The way that we may struggle to forgive others, right? He doesn't struggle with that. When he declares, I forgive you, he truly forgives you. He says the word and it's done. It's immediate. It's effective. And when he orders the wind and see peace, be still. And the wind sees and there was a great calm. It was immediate. It was effective. It's like telling a noisy child, hush, be quiet. And just like that, it changed everything. Because Jesus is precisely who he is, the most powerful Lord of lords, King of kings, who can, who can change what man can never do for himself. And perhaps if you were on that boat, you'd feel a chilling calm of that power. That you couldn't even feel the air against your skin. You couldn't even see the movement in the water, not even a ripple. That a great windstorm was instantly changed to a great calm. But not everything was calm at that moment. And why? Because as we read there in verse 41, the disciples were filled with what? Great fear. A great fear. In other words, their fear of death in the midst of a windstorm, did not die down. The wind and the sea did die down, but their fear actually shifted to a greater kind of fear because after they saw and felt the magnitude of, of what his word could do, their fear really had just escalated from here to now being extremely terrified, for this was no ordinary person. Who is this that can make the wind and the sea obey? But Jesus, like a physician, knew exactly the condition of their hearts, which goes much deeper than their fears. Jesus asked, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? In Luke's account, the question of Jesus is much short and direct. Where is your faith? And that's really an important question that we too have to reckon with, isn't it? Where is your faith? Where do you place your trust? To whom do you place your trust? Is it in yourself? Is it in the way you live? Perhaps as Americans, it's very hard to give up our autonomous mindset, isn't it? Right? 
It's, it's my way on the highway attitude. But Jesus reveals this reality in Matthew 7 that many entered the broad and wide way that leads to destruction, but only if you enter the narrow way that leads to life. And, and who is life? Right? Who is the way? Who is this person that even the wind and the sea obey? And the right answer to the test is always Jesus, isn't it? Right? If you don't know the answer, just put Jesus. Because the reality, beloved, that Jesus didn't come into our dark, sin-cursed world just to give us a few lectures or just to showcase his power and then become the most popular figure in history just to be on the front a cover of Time magazine or to be some kind of front man for some political agenda. No. He, he, he came to fulfill his rescue mission for us. And his mission was planned out even before the foundation of the world. And so that finally in this passage, you can realize the third point that Jesus is your faithful Savior. Jesus is your faithful Savior. Your only comfort in life and in death and that's why it's important for us to realize early that we need a powerful God man. That nothing can overcome him. Not even the wind and the sea can disobey him. Because listen, if Jesus isn't infinitely powerful, then he cannot be your faithful savior. If he cannot be your faithful savior, then you and I and everyone else remains hopeless. Hopeless in our sin to pay our penalty. The full death of our sin by God's justice who must punish us eternally, body and soul. And so that's why Jesus, our powerful God, willingly came. Not only to demonstrate his lordship through miracles, but I mean, that's easy for him. He's been doing that for a very long time. But he came to fulfill the mission above all missions. The real mission impossible in order to rescue us. And that is to faithfully subject himself to be human, right? To be human in every way like us, with all its limitations, hunger and pain and fatigue and temptation, yet without ever committing sin. And because he is also God, he is able to subject himself under the law, to perfectly obey every commandment that you and I broke. And that's why as a perfect God-man without any record of sin, he is the only one qualified to die and to be our substitute on the cross. He is the only perfect lamb, the only suffering servant throughout his life in which Jesus says the Son of Man came not to be served, but to what? To serve and to give his life as a ransom for many so that on the third day he would rise again. And so even though Jesus saved the disciples from drowning, he himself drowned for us on the cross, bearing the tsunami weight of God's wrath so that all our sin and all our law-breaking is punished in him while transferring to us his perfect righteousness as if we had never sinned and as if we had never been a sinner. Because death has no power over Jesus. By his resurrection, you too will be resurrected. And that's if you receive him by faith alone. That's if you trust him. That's if you receive him by faith alone and not in yourselves and not in any other thing. And so, beloved, in closing, may you remember that by his death, resurrection, and ascension, by his spirit, you can live a life of peace now. You can live a life of joy now with, with patience and with faithfulness in obedience, that even though we must persevere in this life and continue to share in the sufferings of Christ until he returns, you are not alone. You are not alone because he is with you and he is with you in any storm because the same Jesus who demonstrated his power in the sea storm is the same Jesus who has power over your sin, over sickness, and even death, to relieve your doubts, to bring you to daily repentance with assurance of his forgiveness and eternal life, that no matter what comes your way, even death in this life, you have the hope of resurrection. You have the hope of assurance 
and you have the hope to persevere until we see Christ in glory. But until then, beloved, may you trust in him because Jesus is able to rescue. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we know that without the saving grace of your Son, we are hopeless. Without him, we would remain in doubt. Without him, we would remain in fear and in darkness. And so we thank you that in the fullness of time, you sent your Son who has spoken his word and accomplished what we could never do on the cross. We pray now by your Spirit to continue to guide us, to help us, to, to help us understand your truth, and to help walk in your ways that pleases you. Be with us and grant us grace in our time of trouble. We bless your name and give you all the glory and honor. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, let us please, uh, let's please stand as we sing our song of response. And it's found in our hymnals on page 116a. 116a, I love the Lord for he has heard my voice. And we'll be singing the first four verses from 116a. People of God, receive now God's benediction. Now may he who raises the poor from the dust, the needy from the ash heap, and makes them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honor, bear you through troubled days to you who trust in God's unchanging love. Amen. People of God, go in peace.